Hey everybody, welcome to chapter 1, section 2, uh, Parent Functions and Transformations Notes. Um, what I'm going to do to start things off is just introduce you to the nine different functions that we cover in Algebra 2. Um, we're just going to go over the name of each function and then the graph of each function and then in additional videos, well, I'll talk more about them in particular, like their domain and range. Um, but for right now, we're just going to name them and identify the function type. So to keep this video from getting lengthy, I will um, pre-label all these graphs and then just kind of explain, uh, explain them to you with it already pre-filled out. So let's take a look at that. Okay, so... This first graph here is my linear parent function. So to be a parent function is to just be the simplest form of that function. There's nothing adding or subtracting to it, multiplying, dividing, whatever. Um, just the purest form of that function. And so for the linear one, it's just y equals x. But in Algebra 2, we typically use function notation, so I just rewrote it as f of x equals x and all these going forward I'm gonna write them as f of x equals something the next function makes a V and that's absolute value so just think V for value um, it's important to note that these are bars by the for the equation f of x equals and then you have x inside two bars those are the absolute value symbols um, you know you're taking the absolute value of something when it's in bars like that. Um, other than that, you'll notice that it doesn't make any um, negative y values. It opens up um, as a v. All right. The next one I said is the quadratic function. So the quadratic function makes this parabolic graph, but any polynomial even function will make a parabolic like graph too. It'll look a little bit different than this one here. This one is definitely a quadratic function. Um, but like the bottom will look a little flatter. Um, but if you were to graph like x to the fourth or x to the sixth or x to the eighth, it still essentially have this U shape to it. So that's why I said quadratic slash polynomial even because any any function I give you where x to the even power, um, you'll have a graph that looks similar to this. Um, what you'll see probably most often from in this class is probably quadratic, though, where x squared, or the highest power in that function, is 2. Okay? Um, so, yeah. The next one, cubic. Same thing as before. Most of the time we see cubic functions, but if I change the power to any other odd power, um, it'll still essentially have this same shape, this same zigzag shape. shape. Excuse me. Um, so yeah, cubic is just x to the third. Um, so any function you see where x to the third is the highest power, it's going to make a cubic uh, graph. And then if it's other than 3, like 5, 7, 9, 11, that'll be called a polynomial odd graph. The next one is the square root graph. And again, for the same reasons as before, um, you see square root most often. This is the square root symbol right here. Um, but it's called a radical it's called a radical because you can do other types of roots um, other than the square root. So square to square something is to raise it to the power of 2. So to square root it is to take the second root of something. And if you want to take a different root, you put a little number inside the checkmark part of the radical. And um, that denotes what root you're taking. So if you plug in an even number here, um, if you plug in 2, you're doing square root. If you plug in 4, you're doing the 4th root. 6, you're doing the 6th root, and so on. Any even root will have a similar looking graph to this right here. 
The next graph is, or function, is the cube root graph, and it makes this slanted S style uh, of a graph. And so you see there's the little 3 to denote the cube root inside the checkmark part of the radical. If I replace that with a 5 or a 7 or a 9, it'd make a similar looking type of graph. And so we just call it an odd root function. Um, and so there's your cube root slash odd root. The next graph is the rational slash inverse graph. Um, I believe most of the time in this class you'll see it called the rational graph, but um, sometimes it is referred to as the inverse graph. Um, and this one in particular, it's like the inverse of a linear graph. So at y equals x is the linear graph. Y equals 1 over x, or I should say f of x equals 1 over x, would be the, the inverse of that. Um, and it makes this uh, split graph like this. So the reason why it splits like that is because we can't divide by 0, right? So I can't plug in the number 0, so it fractures off like this. Um, I can plug in like any other number other than 0. Um, but since I can't do that, then I'll never touch the y-axis. and I'll never touch the x-axis. Um, so yeah, this is the rational graph. The next one is the exponential graph. It starts off slow and then takes off exponentially. And that's uh, the parent function is e to the power of x. Um, e is its own kind of special number. And we'll talk about it in detail when we get to that chapter. But if you replace e with any other number, like if it said 2 to the power of x, 3 to the power of x, 400 to the power of x, 0. 0.10 to the power of x, yeah, so, um, you know, w change the e with any number, as long as x is the exponent, you have an exponential function. So even if it's like 1 over 5 to the x power, you still have an exponential function. So it doesn't really matter what number is the base there, unless you're just trying to identify the parent function. Um, as long as the x is the exponent, you have an exponential function. So the exponential functions are commonly confused with polynomial functions. A polynomial function will have a number for your exponent. All right, An exponential function will have x in the exponent. Okay, So that's how you distinguish between the two. And the graphs look very different. The last one we cover is the logarithmic graph. And that's actually the inverse of the exponential graph. If you were to take this graph and like basically flip it on its side, you get the logarithmic graph. And so this is read as log base e. This is like a, su a subscript, a tiny e, of x. So log base e of x, or it's written as ln x. Anything as log base e is rewritten as ln. Again, it's probably uh, confusing to you now. Uh, we will talk about it in detail when we get to that chapter, but I just need you to know that this is what um, the parent function of it looks like right now. Um, so most of these functions go through the origin, meaning they go through 0, 0. You can see them all touching through 0, 0. The only ones that don't are these. Um, and so rational, because you can't divide by 0. With exponential, uh, if you're raising to powers, whether they're big or small, you'll never get to 0. And it's um, kind of a similar uh, understanding for, for logarithmic um, so these are the three that can never touch zero. Everything else will run through zero, zero. If it doesn't run through zero, zero, it's been transformed. It's not the parent function. Okay. Um, so this next part here, how to manipulate a function, that's like how to transform a function. Okay. So we have some actions that are done on the inside and outside of the function. And uh, that will, whether it's done on the inside or outside, will kind of dictate how the graph of it behaves. And the properties are the same for all these function types. Okay, so we have nine function types, 
And if I add a number to the outside of a function or minus a number to the inside of the function, it'll behave the same way with an absolute value function. Um, it'll behave the same way like with an absolute value function and with like a cube root function, okay? Um, so what I mean by inside the function is it's included with the action or with the x. So like if you were to look at like this cube root, the x is being cube rooted. So if I like added a number, it'd be inside the cube root. If I added a number on the outside, it would be outside the cube root. So like over here on the side. Um, so oftentimes on the inside you see parentheses, but not all the time. Like if you have a cube root or like absolute value, if I were doing the absolute value of x minus 2, well, is the minus 2 in the inside or outside? If, is it on the inside of the bars or is it on the outside of the bars? If it's on the outside of the bars, you call it the outside of the function. If it's inside of the bars, it's inside the function. So that's kind of what I mean by that. Um, we are going to write uh, some rules for these right here, but I want to look at some examples of those first before we write the rules. So let's take a look at those. Here I have a whole bunch of examples, um, and we are going to identify the function type, describe the transformation, and state whether it was inside or outside the function. So I'm just going to identify those three key attributes with each function type. And so, like I said, I have a lot of examples here, and so to keep the video from running too long, I'm just going to show you it um, with it pre-solved and and then we'll work with it from that and I'll just explain to you why I wrote what I wrote okay so looking at letter A I have ln x minus 2 so if you see ln that's the natural log making this a logarithmic function the minus 2 is that part of the log or is it not away from the log that's how you know if it's on the inside or the outside and in this case, you'd see parentheses if it were part of it. So it's on the outside. So um, I graphed it, and you see the original lnx, and then this one goes lnx minus 2. And so if you look closely, this one hits through right here, and it goes down two units, and it hits through right there. So the, the minus 2 made it go down 2. The minus 2 on the outside made it go down 2. On letter B, I have e to the power of x. x is in the exponent, making this an exponential function. And so I had plus 3, and I wrote it's on the outside. I know it's on the outside because I'm not plusing 3 as part of the exponent. If it were included with the x, as in inside the exponent, then it'd be inside the function. So plus 3 is not part of the exponent, so it is outside the function. So I got the original e to the power of x in blue. And then you see it goes through the number 1 here, and it shifts up 3 units right there. So um, adding 3 on the outside moved up 3. So if minusing 2 on the outside made it go down 2, and adding 3 on the outside made it go up 3, then let's write a rule for your... Just ignore the other stuff right now. <laughs> I have a pre-written right to save time. But let's write a rule for our outside the function. If plusing 3 made it go up 3, then if I plus some number k, it'll go up k units. If I minus a number on the outside, then it'll go down whatever k is. So this next graph, I have the power of 2. That's my highest power. If 2 is your highest power, you have a quadratic function. I have plus 4, and you see it's in parentheses, so I'm plusing 4 on the inside of it. Um, also, it's like, you know it's on the inside because not only are you squaring x, you're squaring the, the plus 4 as well. So that's also how you know it's on the inside, because it's included with the action of raising it to the power of 2. So when you graph it, you see the original goes through 0, 0, and then the new one goes through negative 4, 0. So it shifted over to the left four units. So plusing four on the inside made it go left four. Okay? 
you might think it goes it's supposed to go right four, but clearly the graph is showing that it goes left four. So plusing four on the inside made it go left four. The next one, I have another exponential equation, e to the power of x minus 1. So x is the exponent, it's exponential. And see how I have minus 1 as part of the exponent this time? That's how I know it's on the inside. There's no parentheses, but comparing it to this one, the plus 3 is on the side of it. It's definitely not an exponent, whereas this is included with the exponent. So that's what I call inside the function. So if it's on the inside, it's going to make it behave differently than if it's on the outside. Because you can see e to the x in green here, and then the e to the x minus 1 is shifted over to the right sum. It's not super obvious to, tell, to be able to tell um, how far over it's shifted. But look, if it says minus 1, then it's shifted over uh, 1 unit. Just you got to tell me what direction. Um, and so you can clearly see it shifted to the right one unit on this one. So let's just recap what we have. Plusing 4 on the inside made it go left 4. Minusing 1 on the inside made it go right 4. So with that information, if you plus a number on the inside, whatever number that is, it's going to go left, whatever number that is. If I minus it, it's going to go right whatever number that is, okay? So these are uh, very common mistakes. People think plus on the inside, they think it's going to go right, which I understand that thinking, but looking at the graph, plus makes it go left, minus makes it go right, so it's opposite of what you would anticipate, okay? So just make a special note of that to yourself. Here I have a cubic function. I know it's a cubic function because it has the power of 3. And I have a negative here on the outside. I know if it's on the inside with the negative if there's parentheses in this case. Um, am, I, am I cubing the negative and the x? No, I'm just cubing the x. You know you're cubing more than one thing when there's parentheses, okay? If there's no parentheses, then the power just goes with whatever is written right outside of it. Um, when you graph it, you see the original makes that kind of S-like shape, and then the new one uh, flips. And so specifically, how did it flip? It's like this top part is now down, this bottom part is now up. It reflected over the x-axis. And it might be hard to tell with this kind of graph because it's symmetrical whether you flip it over the y or over the x. Um, that's why it looks like two perfect U's. Um, but most graphs are, are not symmetrical like that. Um, so the answer will be more obvious on F because I have a negative on the inside and that clearly made it reflect over the Y axis. As you see, it's going to the right and now it's going to the left. Okay. Um, so whereas this one, um, the negatives on the outside. So if it's on the inside and it made it reflect over the Y, the outside must make it reflect over the X. So let me just fully explain F before I get too ahead of myself. F is a square root function because I'm taking the square root of negative X. All right. So that negative is part of the square root. See, it's underneath the square root. If it were outside the square root, it'd be outside the function. Okay. Um, so negative is on the inside, and then, as I said before, when I graph it, it used to go right, and now it goes left, so that's a y-axis reflection. So with that information, we're going to say negatives on the inside of the function are y-axis reflections. Negatives on the outside of the function, see outside of f of x, makes an x-axis reflection. So this next graph, I have absolute value bars, and so it's an absolute value function. I have one half of the absolute value of x. So the one half is not inside with the x, so it's not inside the function. It must be outside. So graphing one half x is um, you see that the original in green 
is a little bit skinnier than the new one in purple. So when you have a one half on the outside, it's called a vertical compression, as if you're pushing down from the top and the bottom of the graph. And as you're doing that, it's going to flatten out that graph. So that's called a vertical compression. And so um, I just wrote it's a vertical compression by a factor of 1 over 2. As long as that number is a fraction that's less than 1, because I can have a fraction like uh, 200 over 4, that is bigger than 1. But if I have 4 over 200, that is smaller than 1. So anytime you have a fraction that's smaller than 1, you're going to have a vertical compression. All right, so what do you think will happen if I have a number bigger than 1? Well, I'm glad you asked. It's going to stretch it. So this is 3 times x squared. Again, it's not parentheses 3x and then that's squared. So that's how you know it's on the outside. Um, but, uh, oh, and then it is quadratic because that's power of 2. Sorry. But it is a vertical stretch by a factor of 3 because you see x squared um, is in purple. And then you see 3x squared is in black. So it's skinnier. So it's as if you're it's as if you're pulling on the top and the bottom like a rubber band and it's getting skinnier. So you say that's a vertical stretch by a factor of three. The next example is what happens if you have a number on the inside. So here I have an absolute value function again, absolute value of 6x, and see how the 6 is with the x on the inside. So inside. And then when you graph it, it gets... Um, it gets skinnier, all right? So it does It does get skinnier like it did with the 3, but since it's on the inside, your language with it has to be different. It has to be opposite. So remember how, like, plus 4 made it go left 4 on the inside? You, so you have to word it opposite, all right? So if it's horizontal, if it's on the inside, it's going to be horizontal. And so horizontal compression that's as if you're pushing on it from the sides if you're pushing on it from the sides then it'll get skinnier so um it has a similar effect to a vertical stretch um but you say vertical stretch for all the stuff on the outside and you say horizontal compression for all the stuff on the inside and then you flip that number too so if it was a six you say horizontal compression by a factor of one six i don't know why that is, I just know that's how it is, all right, so I know it's kind of confusing, but if you just kind of get it in your head, like, oh, inside's opposite, then that helps. Looking at j, I have another quadratic function, because I have the power of 2, that 1 over 4 is inside, you see how I have parentheses this time, I'm doing 1 over 4x, and then I'm squaring that, um, so you see the originals in green and the new ones in purple. So it's as if you were to pull on it from the sides. And so that's going to stretch it horizontally, similar to a vertical compression. But since you have to flip it, since, or like the language, you know, you have to be opposite horizontal stretch by a factor of four, because it was one fourth. So you say by a factor of four. So basically you just flip whatever the fraction is. And if it's not a fraction, you just make it into a fraction. Just throw a, a, a 1 on top of it. So for inside, say if you're multiplying a number on the inside, that's a horizontal stretch or compression, depending on the size of the number, right? And if it is on the outside, that's a vertical stretch or compression. All right, depending on the size of the number. These last two examples, I did combinations, um, meaning more than one transformation. So I'll try and explain this as thoroughly as possible. Here I have a 5 for my root. So that's a fifth root. That's an odd number, making this an odd root function. I have a couple things on the outside and one thing on the inside. Negative is on the outside of the fifth root, and the plus 6 is on the outside of the radical. So these are both outside. The 2 is on the inside. 
So what I did was I made several several graphs so um, it'd be easier to tell what's going on. So I have the original in green here, and um, you can see it makes that kind of S-like shape. And then the negative is in purple, and it's going the opposite way. So is it flipping over the x-axis, or is it flipping over the y-axis? And again, like the example I did before with the, the cubic root, um, it's hard to tell. But how did we define a negative on the outside? So we go over here, and we say negative on the outside is an x-axis reflection. So I go back over here, and that's what I wrote down, x-axis reflection. Then the next thing I need to look at is what is that 2 doing? That 2 is on the outside and it's multiplying. So in black, you see the graph is a little bit, I don't know how you might say it, taller. This is if you were pushing on it from the sides, right? So if you're pushing on it from the sides, that's a horizontal compression by a factor of 1 half. You see how I flipped that number? And then the plus 6 just made it go up 6. You see it clearly go up 6 units right there. And so that's everything that's going on with K. With L, I have the fourth power. So that's going to make this a polynomial even function. And then I have a negative with the X. And so that's on the inside. And then the 4 thirds and the minus 3 are on the outside. So looking at the original, you actually don't see any blue graphs. You see just the green graph. Um, that's because it's overlapping with the blue graph. Because if you have a negative on the inside, that makes a y-axis reflection. So if you have a symmetrical graph like a parabola and you flip it along the y, it's just going to look exactly the same. So, uh, But the transformation is still there. That negative has to do something. So... Negatives on the inside, we, we define that as y-axis reflections. That's still true, okay? The minus 3 just made it go down 3. You see it starting at negative 3. And then the 4 thirds, I said vertical stretch. Why do I use vertical? Because it's on the outside of the function, so I'm going to use vertical stretch or compression. And you don't flip the number if it's vertical stretch or compression. You can see here in black that it's a little bit skinnier so it's that you pulled on it from the top and bottom just a little bit to stretch it out and um, so yeah you just say vertical stretch by a factor of four thirds um, so that's the last example I hope this video was educational and thank you for watching uh, see you next time goodbye